Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Big Anklevich. He's a very strange young man. And Rish Outfield. You're a slacker. Do you want to be a slacker for the rest of your life? And don't forget, announcer man. What are you looking at, butthead? Hi everybody, welcome to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. Episode 1. 122. Wow, you stumbled through that admirably. Well, that's because I'm Rich Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. Glad to have you aboard. It's a new year. And even less importantly, this is new recording equipment. Yeah, baby. For the first time, we are doing an episode with mic stands. Mics that don't suck. And spit guards? What are these things called? They're called pop filters. Pop filters. That's right. And a soundboard that it somehow knows I'm talking because a green light goes on when I talk and when I stop it goes off. It comes on on the other side for me when I talk. Oh, wow, because we're recording on two channels? It's so fancy. So I hope that this sounds better than our previous episodes. And, you know, if, if it doesn't, then that's just a testament to you cleaning up the sound and doing the best that you could with it. But if it sounds better, then you have Sir Scott Pig to thank. That's right. We'd like to thank him as well because uh, we, we're we happy to have him. We have him to thank, yes. It was just for Christmas or what? Did he ever explain why? I think he uh, found a suitcase full of money that was in a downed plane. He just kind of held on to it long enough to find out whether anybody was looking for it or not. And when finally nobody asked for it, he just started spending it willy-nilly. And I think that's where this all came from. Scott, D.B. Cooper is looking for you, but thank you for the equipment. I hardly feel like we deserve it. Seriously. (laughs) The sad thing is we've had this equipment for like a month and a half or something. But I couldn't figure out how to get the mics attached to the stands. And then just the other day, I took a look at it again and I went, Oh, this little piece just comes right out and then it fits exactly right. If only I'd thought about it. I was actually this close to sending him an email and saying, Hey, uh, is there like an adapter or something we could get to make the stand fit the microphone? Because it's it's too small. And That's uh, what she said. At least I was able to avoid the uh, reply email where he says, yeah, take that little silver piece out from the middle numb nuts and it'll work just great. So here we are, face to face. A couple of silver spoons. And we've got a story for you today to go along with these new mics. Okay. Uh, It's called Rain by Abigail Mannheim. About the author. Abigail Mannheim has been writing for uncounted decades, though not for publication, just because she has to. Her work includes poetry and fiction and something that's not quite fiction but definitely isn't the truth either. She lives in the air about a mile above Montclair, New Jersey, with two cats, an occasional son, a roommate with... A hedgehog and too many books. She wants to grow up to be a hermit and order everything online and have the pizza delivery man slip her food under the door a slice at a time. Who produced this episode, Big? Today's episode was produced by Renee Chambliss. Not only did she produce it, she narrated it. So you're definitely in for a treat. Rock on. Also available in 2D. Rain by Abby Mannheim. Great grandmother was born before, and she has many memories from that time. She talks about war and environmental horrors and diseases that couldn't be cured, things we have all read about in our history modules. In the mods, though, It all sounds like a regular story, where one thing just follows another, naturally and inevitably. The rise of farming, the Industrial Revolution, the consequent damage to the planet, the age of travel and information, 
the pandemics, the wars for resources, the droughts. The natural outcome, then, of figuring out how to change it. They had the knowledge. They knew what had gone wrong. Now it was just a matter of getting people to follow the new rules. I wonder how they managed it. The pages I pull up in my tea book all have pictures and stories of what it was like before. Battle scenes, smoggy, crowded cities, all those people driving their individual polluting machines, focused only on themselves and making their own decisions, even when it affected everybody. Billions of voices wanting to be heard, willful, disobedient, And then you have after, with the clean, tranquil streets, the parks, the clear sky, civilized, lawful people. But no one says how it all happened. I asked great-grandmother once, and all she said was, Change is always hard. And her hand shook a little with the memory. Not everyone has a great-grandmother. There aren't a lot of old people at all, if you really pay attention. I don't think a lot of people survived the change. No one says this, but it's what I think. Great-grandmother is different from people born after. She's smaller, for one thing, and very, very pale. Even paler than I am. And her face... It's hard to describe, but it leans a little one way. She has a dark spot on her jaw she calls a birthmark, and her eyes are so light, they are almost silver. When I was very little, I used to stare at her. She was so different from everyone else. Everyone looks the same now, great-grandmother sometimes says, but that's not true. Another thing they teach us about is diversity. It's all about how different we are. Some of us are blonde, and some are dark-haired. Our skin can be all different shades of tan. And our eyes can be different colors and shapes, too. No two people are exactly alike. But if you look really hard at those old pictures from before, you can kind of see what she's talking about. There were more skin colors and body shapes and, well, irregularities. People who were too small or too large or not put together quite right. Why? I asked her once. That distant look that she sometimes gets when she talked about before went away, and she picked me up and pulled me onto her lap. I remember turning and playing with her long white hair, silken handfuls that slid lightly through my fingers. It's better this way. We can get in before a baby is born now and get rid of all the bad things that can make you sick when you're born or even later in life. Along the way, some other things get changed. You can think of it as a spring cleaning before the baby is born. I giggled. (laughs) A sonic blast inside mommy. Laundered and ironed out. Great-grandmother agreed. Born clean and healthy. But that look on her face seemed like a mask, and somehow I had the feeling that maybe she didn't think it was all that good a thing. Great-grandmother doesn't just look different from other people. She acts different, too, almost as though she isn't really a part of things, but is just watching from outside, from somewhere else. When we watch news feeds, she talks about them, not us, even though one of the first things we learn is that everything that happens on the feeds happens to us, and never them. The other old people are probably like that, too, But I wouldn't know. Great-grandmother does not have friends among them. When we meet them on the street, they treat her politely. More than politely, respectfully. It's almost fair to say that they seem a little afraid of her. 
My parents named my baby brother Rain, and I was nine when he was born, so I remember my very first look at him. I reached out and he grabbed my finger, holding on with a strength out of proportion to the fragility and size of his hand. He likes me, I said. That's instinct, my mother said. But I'm sure he will like you someday when he knows you. But as I looked into his eyes, I knew that he liked me already. <laughs> Rain was a colicky baby, and he cried a lot. He scared everyone except great-grandmother, who spent a lot of time holding him and crooning to him to soothe his fussing. Mother and father and the Medis were worried and confused, but great-grandmother said that lots of babies used to be colicky, and they just outgrew it. The Medi on call that day gave great-grandmother an exasperated look. But they aren't colicky anymore, the Medi said. She was impatient because she wasn't used to crying babies, and because she didn't know what was wrong, and because of the drought. We were having a drought that summer, the first one since before. It wasn't a drought like the ones you read about in the history mods. They said the weather system had broken down, but that they would be able to fix it. And there was plenty of water, because we had stored it and used it wisely, and had managed our rainfall well. That's what they told us every night on the feeds. But they must have been worried, or they wouldn't have said it so often, reminding us to stay careful and wise. For the first time in my life, I lived in a world where everyone around me was anxious and tense. And through the long, dry months, Rain just cried and cried. <laughs> One day, when Rain was three months old, and people were so brittle from the dryness that they nearly broke, I went into his room and picked him up, and he stopped crying just like that. He stared directly at me, and in the silence, I stared back. His eyes were still a depthless baby gray. My parents said that they would change eventually and turn brown or blue or green, but they never did. I stared back. Rain, I said out loud to fill the emptiness, not knowing if it was a name or a command. And in the distance, I heard thunder, and the patter of rain began. Rain stopped crying all the time, and when he did get cranky, I was the one who could always make him stop. Also, he was late in talking, and like many an older sister, I interpreted his intentions to the world until he could speak for himself. I spent a lot of time with him and with great-grandmother while my parents worked or went to community meetings. I attended class on the nets, and when he turned three, Rain came with me to social education at the community center four afternoons a week. Rain was different from other kids, quieter, more observant. Even though we all know it's okay to be different, kids still tease each other. It's better to be the same as everyone else, as much as you can be. They don't teach us that exactly, but we all know it anyway. In my age group, there was a boy who had one green eye and one blue eye, and he was always called Mutant. Mutant and I became best friends because I got teased about my unusually pale skin, almost like great-grandmother's, and he got teased about his eyes. I hoped my little brother would find a good friend like Mutant. When I picked him up to go home at dinner time, my brother reached for my hand, and we walked the short distance to our home building together. We picked up dinner from the commissary on the way and played word games as we walked. I promised I'd teach him to ride a bike as soon as he could reach the pedals, and sometimes he'd stand with the food while I picked up one of the community bicycles and showed him how I could ride with no hands. After dinner, Rain and great-grandmother and I would walk to the park, 
or go gardening in the local vegetable gardens. The three of us were very close. On days when it was scheduled to rain, we did indoor things after dinner. We played games, we watched the nets. Great grandmother liked to pull up old cinema, and we watched films together while she told us about the movie stars and how everyone used to know who they were and what they were doing and how rich they were. I thought it was stupid then, great grandmother said once. Isn't it? I asked. We all know it's better if no one stands out and gets super rich. That if you get super rich, you start getting greedy and you use too much food and too much energy and take up too much land. They call it a wealth spiral. They teach you about it in first year social education. The way the science mods teach you about the water cycle. And the math mods teach you that two plus two equals four. Great grandmother didn't seem to answer. Even the movies were different. They were more exciting. Her eyes were distant again, looking into a far off past I couldn't see. I didn't say anything, because I knew it was true, and a tiny part of me had thought that before. They were more exciting, and it was always because people did things they shouldn't do. Mostly the weather system was functional after that first drought, but it wasn't as stable as before. Sometimes it didn't rain on schedule. But we never went for months without rain the way we did the first time. Rain loved rain. When it was scheduled, he would wait at the window for it, looking up at the spreading clouds, almost breathless and with his eyes lit up, until the first drops started to fall. It didn't always start exactly at 6.30 anymore, the way it used to. But it might start a little after, or even a lot after and Rain would stand there until it did, a tension gripping his shoulders as he stared at the sky. With the rain, the tension would release, and he would turn around, a smile on his baby round face, and come and sit down with great-grandmother and me as we paged through the evening's possible entertainment. One wet night, when Rain was five and I was fourteen, great-grandmother took a box out of the back of her closet and we looked through it. There were some rationing cards and a passport, things I'd only seen in museums, and a piece of gold jewelry that I knew must be too large and over quota, and which we had to agree to keep secret before she would show it to us. It was an oval locket on a long chain that opened up to show two tiny photographs. You wore it around your neck, she said. Although the chain was so long, I didn't see how you could wear it without having it get in the way when you gardened or worked at the terminal. On one side was great-grandmother as a girl. She had to tell us before I realized it. But then I could just see her there, her eyes and mouth familiar on the face of a girl not much older than I, and on the other side, a young man. Is this great-grandfather? I asked. And when great-grandmother shook her head no, the enormity of this shocked me. I knew by now, for instance, that I would marry mutant. There were not a lot of boys my age in the community to choose from, and mutant and I got along pretty well. We had known this for years. If I didn't marry mutant, one of us would be bitterly disappointed. And there could be disagreements and feuds because of it. How we had reached this conclusion, I couldn't say. But we knew it was expected, and Mutant and I would marry, as much for the community as for ourselves. I stared at the gold metal locket in my hand, realizing that in it were the seeds of all things bad. Greed and jealousy and anger. I put it down quickly, as though it burned me, and asked great-grandmother the less frightening of my two questions. Great-grandmother, aren't you worried that having this will make you greedy? Great-grandmother took back the locket, 
and held it for a moment before answering. It has made me greedy, she said slowly, but not for the things you would think. And she put the locket away. I never did ask the first of my questions, which was who the young man was, but I am sure that it was he for whom she was greedy, and for an age where your choices could ignite passions and produce great stories like the ones in great grandmother's old cinema films. Another indoor night, we looked at photographs that great grandmother kept in a yellowed envelope in her closet. Rain picked one up and stared at it for a long time. Still a quiet child, he handed it to great grandmother for her explanation without saying a word. I peered over her shoulder at a color photo of a street scene. I guessed it was New York Island because of the taxis and tourist buses. We had visited New York Island once. The island was perfectly preserved as the National Museum of Before. The streets were gray and dead. The shops eerily set up with the doors wide open, as though everyone had just run out the door for lunch and would return in a moment. But the New York in Great Grandmother's picture was a riot of colors and grays. Rain poured down over black asphalt streets while umbrellas rioted in all colors and patterns, solid reds and blues and yellows, plaids and polka dots, some that seemed to have pictures on them. Bright yellow taxis dotted the background. The store windows were vivid with signs and an abundance of colorful merchandise. People's clothing was shockingly bright. The photo caught a sense of movement. The cars on the street... So many, all crowded together, and the people on the sidewalk, hurrying about their business. Someone had a dog on a leash, and the dog was wearing a funny little plaid coat. Some kids in the foreground were wearing bright yellow jackets and hats, like a rain uniform, and they splashed in a puddle, their faces bright with joy, and something I couldn't name— the sense that maybe these children jumped in puddles every week of their lives and still got an inexpressible joy from doing it. And I could see that one of the little girls was great-grandmother, even younger than the girl in the locket. On my brother's face was the same look of elation as on the children splashing in the rain. It was more colorful then. It really was. It's not just the way it looks in the picture. She sighed and added, <sighs> All those artificial dyes, you know? She gave him the photo to keep. Rain treasured that picture, and I often saw him sitting by the window, looking at it, and then looking out at our peaceful, well-designed, and perfectly maintained world where the colors are always more muted than in that old faded photograph. Two years later, great-grandmother died. It happened one night as she slept. Father called her for breakfast in the morning, and when he didn't get an answer, he opened her door and found her. He called the Medicor, and they came in and got her and we had a last chance to say goodbye before they took her away. It's not the way they say it is, that people look as though they are asleep. There is a stillness no sleeping person has. That sense of sleep is just because you can't believe that so much has left a person so quickly. Your eyes won't let you see what's there, or what's not there more precisely. That night, Rain and I met outside great-grandmother's room after midnight, moving silently so we wouldn't wake mother and father. We hadn't planned it, but we both knew we had to take the big gold locket before anyone else could find it and take it away. Once, people used to put their dead in the ground and they gave up acres and acres of space for these cities, 
keeping a tiny spot for each one of their dead and trying to keep them from returning back to nature for as long as they possibly could. Now we return our dead to the earth with quiet dignity, they say. Although great-grandmother once said it didn't seem very dignified to be burned up and dumped out on the ground somewhere, no matter how much poetry they read for you while they did it. The memorial for great-grandmother was, as usual, one month later, which gave people time to plan for it, and for people in other communities who might have known her, to hear about it and travel to be there. Even though we were supposed to be sad at memorials, it was fun to have a few people visit from other places and to see new faces once in a while. I was stunned, though, to find that the community center was overflowing with visitors for great-grandmother, mostly old people. I never knew there were so many, although when I talked to them, I found that many of them came from very far away, farther than I am likely to travel in my life. I wondered how so many people had come to know great-grandmother, who never seemed to have any friends. But all of these strangers talked about her as though they had known her well, once upon a time. Mother chose a place in a grove of dogwoods for great-grandmother, because great-grandmother had always loved dogwoods. Everyone gathered there in the afternoon. People brought flower seeds to scatter on her spot. There would be music and readings. People had brought instruments, touch pads with poems in them, sometimes by famous poets, and sometimes things they wrote themselves. Some people came to memorials, I thought, just to read their own poetry for an audience. There was a strangely festive atmosphere at these things, unless the person was young and had died by accident instead of age. But that didn't happen very often. I was eager to hear what people had to say about great-grandmother. Rain and I stood hand in hand, waiting for the speakings to start. And so I could feel the energy when it started building inside him. I knew that if I looked at him, I'd see the same expression of anticipation that he always got before it rained. And instead of looking at him to be sure I was right, I looked up at the sky, where clouds were gathering, really gathering, the way it said in the old stories, as though they were being called from somewhere else, and not spreading out from the center, as they do for scheduled rains. A sharp, chill breeze picked up. I shivered. Other people were looking up now, too, and a nervous shudder ran through the crowd, and an uncomfortable murmur. It was going to rain. We were outside, and it was going to rain, not on schedule, and no one knew what to do. They kept looking up at the sky, and then at each other. There was a rumble of thunder, and a collective gasp from the crowds. When one drop and then another hit the ground, people started running for their bicycles, or gathering at the road to wait for the Omni. Then the rain poured down and there was chaos as the remaining people ran for cover under trees or picnic tables. One woman screamed, and her husband threw his light jacket over her head, looking up at the sky as though it had personally betrayed him. Rain still stood next to me, trembling slightly, almost vibrating with the energy that ran through him. I stared at him, and, hearing our parents call for us, I grabbed his hand and pulled him away to a picnic table hidden in the trees and hauled him under it. I could still hear my parents calling for us, but for the moment I ignored them. Rain? I said. He looked at me with his unfathomable colorless eyes. Eyes the color of rainwater, I realized. Eyes in black and white. Thunder rumbled a deep bass in the background, and sheets of water poured across the top of the picnic table above us. My parents' voices were getting more distant. 
Rain, how do you do that? I asked him. Rain was silent. They never fixed the weather system, did they? I asked. He answered, They never had one. They only had great grandmother, and now they have me. After great grandmother died, Rain carried her photo everywhere, although it was damp spotted and a little crumpled now. And for 40 days after her memorial, Rain didn't say anything, and for 40 days, it didn't rain. During those 40 days, Rain and I watched old cinema almost every night, even though we didn't know the really good films to watch without great-grandmother to tell us. We watched anything. We didn't care. We were watching for the textures of life, the flaws and asymmetries in the actors' faces that made them recognizable from one film to the next. We watched the way people took the vagaries of weather for granted— and simply went out in the rain, because that was what you did. And we watched for the jealousies and the petty meanness of people, the dishonesties and misunderstandings that made plots jump with feeling, and had you holding your breath until the end, to see if they caught the bad guy, or if the lovers found each other after all. During the day, Rain spent hours on the nets, rereading the history mods, or looking at pictures of how things were before. He spent days looking at street scenes of excitement and squalor, pictures of sad, poor people standing outside shabby shops with no hope in their eyes, pictures of rich, famous people whose eyes were screened by sunglasses and whose jaded smiles gave little else away about the people inside. He spent weeks looking at pictures of people in the rain, going about their business as though it were simply a part of life. I looked over his shoulder when my own work wasn't keeping me busy and tried to see through his eyes. But I didn't know if he was looking at the faces subtly different from our own, where the darkest people were darker than any I have ever seen in real life, and the lightest were almost impossibly pale like great-grandmother, or if he was looking at the motorized cars belching carbon monoxide, the hurried and crowded avenues, and the press of strangers competing for space on the sidewalk. Did he see the elated children or the exhausted stares of anxious adults? Did he see a world sumptuous in color and feeling? or terrifying in its potential for loneliness and failure. I didn't ask him. I did not know which I was looking at myself. Finally, on the fortieth dry and silent day, he turned to me and spoke. There will never be anyone like great-grandmother again. I thought he was only talking about his grief at losing her, and I agreed. Yes, Great-grandmother was unique. We will miss everything special about her. I knew I was parroting words from social education, words that were always supposed to help, but which, I had recently discovered, didn't help at all. Rain didn't answer for a long time, but then he said, Great-grandmother was more unique than anyone else. There will never be anyone as unique as her again, ever, unless I stop making it rain. Rain had probably figured it out a long time ago, but the realization hit me like an omni, knocking the wind out of me so I could hardly breathe. On the one side was a perfectly balanced world, where everyone had enough food, enough shelter, enough of whatever they needed. On the other side was a chaotic world in which people did greedy things, abused the earth, and created great and wonderful art, the product of selfish individualism. We had chosen a world of abundance and community, and we had been able to, because of great-grandmother, 
who was able to make it rain or not. If you control the weather, you control the food supply. If you control the food supply, you control humanity. You can whip us into fear and anger, and you can teach us to change our behavior, like rats who learn to tap the red button for food instead of the blue one. Great-grandmother must have believed in our ways once, I said. She made it all happen. Rain said nothing. We have chosen to live wisely and sustainably. Again, I heard the words from social education on my lips. It's not sustainable. It can't ever be sustainable. If you're breaking the laws of nature, it doesn't matter how you do it. With weather systems or people doing what they shouldn't be able to do, the law catches up with you. It was the fundamental flaw of our existence, one which was never acknowledged. Year after year, the history mods reminded us that humans teetered on the brink of disaster before because they broke the laws of nature. And after, we have chosen to live in harmony with the earth. But we haven't. We have chosen to live in complete but benign domination. And once again, we have managed to sow the seeds of our own destruction. That's why you're not making it rain, I said. Not a question, but an accusation. I wanted to see if it remembers how to rain, he answered. But I like our life, I said lamely, as though saying so would change the facts. It's a fine life, Rain said, although I wasn't sure he agreed. I thought he would probably pick the colorful rainy city with all its great stories over our quiet, muted, sufficient life. I would not. It's a fine life, repeated Rain. But we can't sustain it. Rain had made up his mind, it seemed, and the rest of us would have to adapt. Perhaps great-grandmother had done that, too. I remembered wondering how we got from before to after, and great-grandmother's answer, change is never easy. Her hand shaking, not only with remembrance of suffering, but the remembrance of responsibility. It's not just that people will suffer in the meantime, I said. It's that at the other end, when resources get scarce, we'll get greedy people and, oh, Rain, all the same old problems. Rain turned back to the nets, scanning through pages faster than I could keep up. Maybe, he agreed. It's a risk, but I think people are wiser. I shook my head. People are people. It's only our laws that are wiser. I know it was bad before, but it wasn't all the same amount of bad, Rain explained. By the end, things that were okay hundreds of years before, like burning witches, weren't okay anymore. Even though there were lots of wars, people generally knew that they were a bad thing. They just didn't know how to stop. Before that, people thought wars were glorious. Great-grandmother couldn't do everything by herself, you know. She could just manage the rain. A lot of people had to agree on what changes had to be made. They tried. They meant well. So do you, I said. On the 41st day, I could smell the difference in the air when I woke. It was strangely dark outside, not like night, but as though the sun had started to come up, but had given up. I went to wake up rain. It's remembering, he said, still half asleep. I've been trying to help it. When it remembers, it will not want to stop, he added. I thought about that, wondering if he was right. Endless days of rain, crops destroyed, 
Had we lived wisely enough to see us through this as well? I think we need to get ready, I answered. The highest place we knew we could get to was a day's bike ride away. It was a tourist wilderness, crisscrossed by marked trails and dotted with map kiosks that would make it easy to find our way up to the highest point we could manage. We packed clothing and blankets and what little food we could find. It would not be enough. We would have to stop at the commissary, make up some story, get more food, I wore great-grandmother's locket. Rain carried her photograph. We stepped outside into the gray, heavy air. The sky was filled with clouds, boiling like a pot of water. We took community bicycles to the commissary, where we found we were in luck. Because of the strange weather, they were handing out two full days' worth of food to each family and extra rations of non-perishable items and sacks to carry the extra in. We strapped the sacks onto the bicycle racks and filled all the baskets. As we straddled the bikes to leave at last, I felt a tap on my arm. I turned and found myself looking at Mutant. Please, I'm coming too, he said, both a request and a statement. What do you mean? I asked. And when he didn't answer, I asked more softly, What do you know? I know it's going to rain, Mutant answered. I looked at Rain, who nodded. Then a strange thing happened, because Mutant leaned across both bicycles and kissed me. Our legs were exhausted with pedaling long before we got there but we kept forcing ourselves, driven by fear and, yes, curiosity. It was the farthest from home any of us had ever been. We were accompanied along the way by a growing crowd of animals, the small, wild animals that lived in the preserve, dogs and cats from the houses, cattle and horses from the farms. I wondered how they got out. I remembered learning long ago that animals had an instinct about natural disasters, and I believed that if they were going where we were going, then we were going someplace safe. Not far from the top of the mountain, there was a cave, clean and dry, and ready for campers to spend the night in the wild. It was even stocked neatly with firewood, a charged fire starter, and extra food. Not exactly the wilderness, I thought, but a far better substitute. It would be a long time before we went hungry. And I thought with a pang of all we would be losing. And then the rain came. Days passed. Long, gray, rainy days. More rain than I could have imagined. It didn't rain hard but it rained endlessly. We watched it soak into dry ground, and then, when the ground was as full of water as it could be, turn into trickles that turned into streams as the water poured down the mountain. We did not know what was going on in the community. Our touch pads were useless, and we didn't know whether it was because the storm had brought down the nets, or whether we weren't in a reception area. I tried not to think of what might be happening, tried not to imagine how high the waters might be, or where people were going for safety, or how many might not make it at all. At first, we were buoyed by the knowledge that we were doing not only the right thing, but the inevitable thing. We talked about it, Rain, Mutant, and I, and reassured ourselves that we were saving the community from a worse destruction later when people had lost the memories of before that would save them now and help them make good decisions. But as the days went by, I became cold and miserable and ready to scream with boredom. We had talked and talked until we could talk no more. Finally, 
When the touch pads ran out of power because there wasn't enough sunlight to recharge them, I found myself getting angry at rain. You make it rain, or you make it not rain, I said to him angrily. Why is it okay for you to break the law of nature? Why won't you break it now? He turned those unfathomable eyes on me, eyes that I now saw were blue-shadowed and sunken. I don't think I ever said it was okay. And he turned back to watching the endless rain, gentle, persistent, unstopping rain. At night, I cried and couldn't sleep. And one night, Mutant drew me into his arms and wrapped himself around me to warm me. And I knew that nature needed one more thing from us, one more wild, lawless act before we could set the world right. And that is how Mutant and I made love, wildly, lawlessly, and with the rain pouring down around our naked bodies because we had crept out of the cave to avoid waking my brother. That night, afterwards, I slept soundly at last and woke up to a sound like a squeak or a creak, repeating, almost musical. Mutant heard it too, and we sat up and listened. A bird, Mutant said. It had been so long, we had almost forgotten. And suddenly there was a chorus of birds as the sun broke through the gray clouds and lit the world with color, the first dawn in uncounted weeks. Where is rain? I asked, turning back to the dark of the cave. And there I saw him, pale and unmoving, having given all of himself to the rain that, in its destruction, would save us. I knelt and touched his cheek and found it cold, as though he had been dead many hours, even while Mutant and I had made love in the rain, even as we slipped out to avoid waking him. Mutant leaned over to pick him up, effortlessly, my brother's body now light and empty of spirit. We stepped outside, and neither of us was surprised to see the rainbow. A dove, gray as rain, led the way as we went down the mountain to see what we had wrought. Author's Note This author confesses that the idea for rain recycles a bunch of old themes. One thing the story explores is if you had something like a utopia where everyone has enough of what they need and is content to live with enough and there's peace and love and justice and all that great stuff that will solve all our problems, will it really look as wonderful as you expect? And another for Ishmael readers is the question of consequences when we break the law of nature. Hope you enjoyed it and thanks. Abby Mannheim. After the story, the cast list. The narrator was played by Ari Champlis, who also produced the story. Great Grandmother was played by Heather Rulo. Mutant was played by Rish Outfield. Young Rain's sister was played by the tie-dye flipster. And Rain was played by Jake. Yes, Carlo. <laughs> that was pretty awesome. We're using it. Are we recording right now? Uh, I think we are, aren't we? The child actually said after the story, the cat. <laughs> That's <was> pretty rad. <laughs> Twas. So, hey, thank you, Renee, for doing all that work for us and uh, recording that. Editing it, musicking it, foleying it, and cast listing it. Yeah, all of those things that are verbs. <laughs> and thank you, uh, Abby, for sending us that story. Our submissions are still closed, though.
Don't say this. <laughs> We've talked about this before. I think back on the uh, beachcombing episode. Beachcomber, beachcomber, little Bo Peep. Yeah, maybe that was the title. I don't really remember very well. With beachcombing, it was the entire cast was one per It was basically just the narrator. There was no lines for anybody else. It was a one-person thing. Then there was the story of the troop, which was also the same thing. A one-person story. There was no lines for people. And uh, Sudden Death Nicole, our submissions editor, got those stories and went, uh, I don't think they're going to want these stories. I and mean, they're good stories, but there's no parts for them. And they always say they got to have a part for themselves. So she rejected them. And then she, she really rejected those other two stories too. She did, yeah. She rejected them, and then afterwards she thought, "Oh, you know what? Maybe I just better check because they were good stories." So she asked me, "Hey, what about sometimes if there's a story that doesn't have a part for both you guys?" And I said, "Well, Rish is the only one that actually has to be in every episode. He's the only one that freaks out about that. I don't mind." I'm not so in love with myself as that. And so I said, go ahead and send them along. So she did. And yeah, it was funny because all three of the ones that she had originally rejected. Yeah, we were just looking at the email and I said, so have you sent rejections to these people already? That And she said, yeah, I sent uh, rejections. And then you see the next email is Rish saying, oh, looks like you better get them back on the line. Because, uh, yeah, we just liked all the stories. That's funny. I, I wasn't aware of the other two stories being like that. This, as far as I knew, was the only one that that had happened. And I just emailed. I went to the story and got her email address and emailed her and said, Hey, I'm sorry. Have you sold it someplace else? We want the story. And, and yeah, I, 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 that's really strange that uh, that was the third one. That, <laughs> yeah. are, are there countless other stories out there that I'm not aware of that have been I guess it's rejected possible, for those but... reasons? They uh, never wound up in our laps later like these three did where she checked and said, you know, these are good ones and I want you guys to see them just in case. Well, that's why we pay. I'm sorry. That's why we have Sudden Death Nicole around. That's right. To do stuff like that, to look out for, uh, you know, the cream of the crop. And I, this story struck me in a really strange way. It's not a Doonstief story. It's not the kind of stuff we would play on our show. It's the kind of story you would have on one of those literary podcasts or one of those podcasts where they take award-winning, uplifting stories from the past and, and, and play them for a new audience and, and, and things like that. And, and so it's just strange that the author would send this our way. Uh, and I'm glad that she did. I and mean, you know what? I might be totally wrong. You feel free to re refute that if you'd like. No, I, I agree with you. It's not uh, generally our cup of tea or our milieu or our bailiwick what the f <laughs> is that a word i love that word it's such a stupid sounding word warning <laughs> it needs to be used today's episode contains the b word yeah it's not the normal kind of fare that we uh, put on here our, our, our stuff i think has a tendency to be more adventurous fun and sometimes just empty-headed but this one's definitely not not uh, along those lines it's really interesting and more kind of a thought-provoking and not just a, a easy you know fun ride kind of a thing where you're done and you're like yeah that was all right it's one where you, you think about it a little more it's interesting because you know we had scott westerfeld on the show just a couple weeks ago and i've been reading his Uglies, Pretties, Specials, Trilogy. Extras. Uh, that's extra. Not part of the trilogy. You are. But uh, yeah, I've been reading those and the world that is set up in this, this utopia slash dystopia that uh, she's got set up here where it's a utopia. But is it really a utopia? People are less happy because of the utopia. Everything is great, so nothing is really great because I guess when it comes down to it, you got to have the opposite. You can't know what white is unless you've seen black or you can't know what happiness is unless you know sadness. That kind of stuff just isn't working out. You know, they've been forced to not do that kind of thing. 
and it's taken all the joy out of life because it's taken all the sadness out of life. You know, you can't have anything sweet when you don't have the bitter because it doesn't mean anything. If you only have sweet, then it's not sweet. It's just normal. It's an important part of life is there has to be sadness to go along with the happiness and for the happiness to even matter, for the achievement to matter. If you go out and you do something and you succeed, well, it only matters if you've failed before too. It only is something important and special to you if you know what failure is. I know this may alienate a lot of our listeners, but for example, John Elway, when he finally won the Super Bowl, it was so much sweeter to him because he lost it three times before he finally won it. Oh, see, I thought you were alienating our listeners because you were about to say John Elway was a douche. <laughs> no, John Elway. So I was preparing myself for that. And I was like, everybody loves John, John Elway. Yeah, John Elway. There's nothing wrong with him. But uh, I was just alienating our listeners because I, I assume most of them don't care about sports. But yeah, those achievements, you know, we talked about in our last episode about all our goals and stuff and we want to be able to do something and i think when we manage to achieve those things it's so much sweeter because we already know what it's like to not achieve we know what it's like to be the guy who failed fell on his face you know i don't know i think that's that's something i guess that's really important in life and when we see that here that's kind of what this utopian society is it's so great that it's just not great if that makes any sense. Yeah, I, I don't know that it does, but that's what I was thinking about while we listened to the story. I wanted to talk about utopian society and whether this actually was a utopia or not. But then right in the author's note, Abby says that it is. Or is it? Right. Thank you for that. I'm not as well read as, well, 1% of the people out there. But, you know, I haven't read a heck of a lot of utopian future stories. And part of it is because I haven't read enough books. But the other part has to be because it's awfully hard to write an enthralling story set in a utopian future. And, uh, you know, I was going to talk about that. And he was like, what is a utopia and what is a perfect future and, and, and what would be great about it? But then you said what you said, and it made me think that maybe there's no such thing as a utopian future because human nature requires a person to look forward, to strive for something new, to go beyond the horizon and wonder what's over there and not be content with what you have. Even if you have everything, that is what being a human being is, is getting tired of the things that you have and longing for something you don't have. So even if it was a perfect world, we would find a way to look at the cracks in this perfect world and say, you know, it's not so good. I liked it better before when I was miserable. It seems like uh, utopian societies require freedom being taken away and incentives being taken away and everybody just has to be the same. For there to be a utopia, which I guess is kind of a good ideal, everybody to be the same, but only if it's done willingly. I don't know. I, I mean, I started to talk about the Scott Westerfeld trilogy with the uglies and stuff, and it's the similar kind of a thing where everyone is beautiful and everyone is happy, but along with that, their brains are tampered with so that they don't long for things like human beings do. They're they're just happy frittering away their life in empty-headed pursuits instead. There's a, Sign me up, by the way. <laughs> and there's a few uh, kind of shady people in charge at the top that, you know, make everybody do things the way they want it to be and do what they will with people's lives and, and so forth. And uh, it seems like a lot of those uh, utopian stories are always not just utopias, they're utopia slash dystopias because to have a utopia seems like always the freedom is taken away or something like that is removed so that you're not complete. And I guess when it comes down to it, you can't tell a story about a utopia that really is perfect because then where's the conflict? And a story is about conflict, so... Well, surely you could <laughs> invent an outside source of this conflict. A natural disaster, whatever, striking in a utopia is still dramatic. 
I or suppose. an alien invasion attacking a utopian Earth is dramatic. And, and I, I don't know. I've never read it. Never read anything. I mean, seriously, the Star Trek universe is the closest to a utopia I've ever read. And those are still people with goals that you're right. trying to meet and weaknesses. And uh, there, there's still a ways to go for humanity. And, and maybe there, there always will be. I, I, it's, it's hard to say if we saw people in the world of rain from our perspective, we would find them more alien, I would imagine, and more off-putting than the characters in rain looking at us, where they think we're quaint and, and sort of interesting in a way that nobody is interesting anymore. And, and it's like, wow, they had ugliness and uh, yuck, but I can't look away from the ugliness. I think we would be just horrified. We would, I would probably the Z word would be used, and so don't say that. What the Z word? Don't say it. Why not? Because it's ridiculous. All right. What would the Z word be? Your children. Xenobiologist. Wait, no, that's an X word. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, that is interesting. You know, it's. You take people like this, whenever there seems to be people, they're, oh, they're perfect and they're happy. That's something that's always made fun of. It's like Mitt Romney, who's running for president. Whenever they do a skit about that guy on Saturday Night Live, he's always like, dirty dur, I'm so boring. Ain't that great? It's kind of the way things are, you know. There needs to be flaws and needs to be imperfections for things to be interesting you know when you look in beauty magazines you see page after page after page of perfect faces and if you don't have something about it that's interesting then it's not interesting and you don't remember it it's like musicians you know you you got rock bands and there's lots of bands that have just great singers or people on American Idol or whatever, those kind of things. They're great singers, but there's nothing characteristic about their voices and, and they don't last. And then there's people that come on that have scratchy voices or really quirky, weird voices. And those are the people that stick around and have careers for years and stuff because... Because you hear them and you know that's yeah, them. Yeah, you know that's them and you remember their stuff and you're like, oh yeah, and I love the way their voice does this weird thing all the time. and it's so cool. Imperfections I think, sometimes make things work and they're just as important as, as the beauty is, I guess. Well, now that we have these perfect mics, our show will lose something. That's the right. imperfection made us good. Tell the listener where those mics that we've been using for the past two years came from. <laughs> the mics we've been using for the past while, my daughter got them as a Christmas present for her uh, high school musical karaoke game for the PlayStation 2. <laughs> came with these mics. You know, we thought, well, let's try these out. They got a USB connector, at least. That's cool, right? And so we've been using those for all that time. That's how fancy we are here at the Dune Steve. Hey, we made it work. You you can make things work with what you got. Yep, even if it's ugly. And, you know, you got to ask yourself that question. <laughs> I can't do it. I hate it. It's only been a week and I can't say it. You can do it. You can do it, Rudy. Ugh. You know, that's something that we talk about as far as, like, movies go and stuff a lot. That somebody that really cares, somebody that works really hard can make a better product than somebody that has just unbelievable amounts of money to throw at it or the cutting edge special effects and stuff, you know, just passion or work or, or caring. I guess passion and caring are, are synonyms, but yeah, we had like the cheapest microphones you could buy for the first year and a half. Uh -huh. And then the cords kept shorting out. Right. And then we had even cheaper microphones. <laughs> That weren't even made for a recording. Mics. It was made for a video game. That were free, right. And we made that work. And, and now, thanks to Scott, this is like professional stuff, right? I, it's really nice. I don't know. I, I, it's, it's cool. I, hopefully you'll take a picture of us with the new microphones and people can see if they want to see. We'll put it on the <laughs> Facebook page or something, okay? Right. And now it's time to talk about something completely different. 
He stole that from Monty Python, announcer man. Wow. No, no. He didn't. How dare he? We don't ever steal things from Monty Python on this show. I didn't expect the Spanish Inquisition. Uh, hey, Big, do you remember last year when I read that Podcastle story, uh, the Tim Pratt one? Uh, yeah. That was actually two years ago now. <laughs> Your mother. It uh, was uh, The Christmas Mummy, and uh, that was a good story. It was. And not long ago, Dave Thompson, the editor, host, ringleader of Podcastle. Ringmaster. Ringmaster. Oh, I like that. <laughs> de- 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 he uh, asked if I would do another story, if I would read a story, or perform another story. He mm-hmm. asked if I would dance. He didn't ask. He just said, dance, dance monkey. monkey. He did. And you danced. You saw the email. So uh, he sent me a story to perform, and it was called A Window Clear as a Mirror. 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 Animal, John. Animal. And uh, it was by Ferret Steinmetz. Anyhow, uh, that's up on podcastle.org right now if you want to check it out. it's uh, now You were in the room when I recorded it, so you're familiar with the story. I was. As well. The story, do you remember what it was about? Should uh, I tell was, people what it was about? It was a fantasy story. What is that fantasy be saying, The fantasy, uh, boo boo, is. Yeah, it was a story about uh, this guy. He comes home one day. He's, he's kind of a normal guy, he's got a normal, boring life. And he comes home one day, and his wife has a portal to the Forgotten Realm or the Magic Hinterland or whatever. I don't. It had a name, I, I think, but. It opened up in their kitchen, and a unicorn came out and said, Come with me to the magic hinterland. And she said, Well, it's too good to turn down, and she left. And this guy deals with the uh, abandonment and, and so forth of being left behind for the magic uh, Never Never Land by his wife. Why is he not good enough? It's, I don't know, you could say it's maybe a little bit of a analogy or a metaphor. Why this guy was maybe left for another lover or divorced or something like that. I'm not sure what the author was really going for, but it was was an interesting story. I found it pretty good. If they'd sent it to the Doonstief, we probably would have taken it. So you'll enjoy it, I think. Well, the the thing that that I got out of it that, uh, that stuck with me is Dave said, you know, here's another fun story for you. Or, or here's another jolly, happy, silly story for you. <laughs> Hope you have fun with it. Or I thought of you and go have a ball. And I read it to myself and I was just like, wow, I, I must have totally misunderstood this story. Because this is awful. No, 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 not awful in terms of content, but awful in tone. I just felt so bad for this poor dude that he can't let her go. Time passes and... You know, the question of why wasn't I good enough or why wouldn't she take me with her or what was it that I did or didn't do? And, you know, it just he becomes obsessed with it to the point where he has to go looking for her eventually. It's it was easy to relate to this character. I mean, he was sort of a sad sack kind of guy, but they didn't paint him as a douche or, a, you know, as one of those guys like on the romantic comedies that works too hard or, you know, it was self-centered or, you know, he, he spent all his time drinking or whatever. He was, like you said, a regular guy, but he wasn't what she wanted. Uh, anyway, it just bummed the heck out of me. And uh, when I read it that night here, I, I, I kept thinking of what David said. I think I emailed Dave and said, sure, I'll, I'll record the story, but you got to know, I, I didn't think this was a blast at all. I, I, I was really depressed by this story. And he's like, oh, well, that's too bad. Read it again. <laughs> or it gave me the impression that I was wrong. And so the second time when it was time to read it aloud, I tried to put a little bit of positivity in that or, or jolliness or what I mean, with the Christmas mummy, it was above all a comedy. Yeah. And then maybe second, something of a Christmassy, heartwarming kind of story. Yeah, Christmas or mummy was a fairly absurd story. The things that were going on were over the top. But would you not say that this started out just as absurd? And it's like... The man comes home to find that his wife had left him for a magical kingdom. Ha <laughs> ha kind of thing. The, 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 idea, the idea that a portal just opened up, and that's it, it just hits you right in the face with it. It doesn't say once there was a land where por- magical portals tended to show up from time to time. It was just the real world, and this happened. Go with it. And so I 
I, I think I tried some lightness and everything except for this main character. I figured if he was dead serious and everybody else wasn't, it would be the best of both worlds. And now the story is over there on Podcastle, and I don't know that I made the right choice. I, I, I've read a couple of the comments in their forums. And I, more importantly, I read what Ferret Steinmetz said on his website. And I guess, like you said, it's a, it's a personal story to him, and it is an analogy of something that happened uh. to him. And so there is that melancholy, there is that true life pain in that story. And if anything, I wish I had just dove into it and seen how miserable I could make it. Like it was a friggin' Mike Resnick story. <laughs> I mean, one without, I yeah. spiked her in her food, friggin', that kind of thing. One without a guy who talks like this. Anyhow, that's over there. You guys can be the judge if you want. I mean, I already made up my mind. I, I, I think I've mentioned it in the blog before, but I always feel honored when other people ask us to read yeah. their stories. I wish that more people would be like Norm is over at Drabblecast and let both of us do it. You know, just switch off the voices and the characters and all that. Just because we're always going to record here for the most part. You're right. always going to be standing there or I'm always going to be standing there. And if both of us don't have something to do... The other one just ends up being the spotter, which is right. fine. But you They're... don't get big muscles being a spotter. You just stand there and watch. And I told you at the time, I was like, hey, read this character. And you said, no. And I was like, oh, go ahead. He only has three lines. And you're like, no. Uh, and what was your reasoning on that? We did that with Pseudopod. And they didn't co get back to us for like three years before they finally said, okay, we'll give you a second try. But don't you dare use another voice. I so. hope you do something with the modulation on it. <laughs> I, I guess so. Uh, it could also be just that they went through a political upheaval over at Pseudopod, and now they've got new editors and all that. I don't know. Uh, the fact that we're duo, I think, gives us more options of things that we can do and make stories more interesting. But, but uh, hey, I recommend that story. Is sometimes uh, there have been stories I've read that I've not been as thrilled with, but I thought this was a really solid one and uh, sad. And I hope I did it justice. So. Yeah, I thought you did a good job. So I think, uh, you know, you, you there were humorous parts in it. And I thought those parts were humorous with what you did with them. So <laughs> We had the uh, outtakes already, right? Where I did Gilbert Gottfried for one of the parts. I don't, I He's think like, I... Here's the problem with your heartache and your... Uh, anyways. I think I saved those for this week's outtakes. So they haven't uh, hit the air yet. I saved them for until after the story came out and we talked about it. So... Now you'll be able to see the outtakes this week. Enjoy. Thanks. Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. But it's a new year, and we got new mics, and uh, we just did a new story by a new author. Are you Were you at all familiar with Abby Mannheim? I've not heard of Abby, Abby Mannheim before, no. She didn't give us a big list of previous appearances and, and being in necrotic tissue and stuff. So I don't, it's possible that she rarely sent out those stories and we were lucky enough to get this one. Or it could be that I've just never heard of her because I don't have a knack for names. We have heard of her and I've just forgotten. That is true. He doesn't have a knack for names. Oh, I don't. There Unless can be a it's story. an actor's name. There can be, yeah, that's true. As any actor in any movie, he can tell you even like... Even, even Patrick really, Warburton. Even the really insignificant ones. But, uh, yeah, he'll hear five different stories from the same author on a podcast that he listens to all the time and doesn't register with him that name at all. I mentioned the name to him. He goes, oh, so who is that? Well, that's not what we wanted to say. We just wanted to thank Scott. We wanted to thank Abby Mannheim and her steamroller. Steam oh, I didn't <laughs> want to go there, but I did. Oh, sorry. Yeah, definitely. Thanks a lot for the, the the story, and thanks, Scott, for the mics, and thanks, thanks. Renee, for the uh, production. She did a great job. I thought that really turned out well. I think those were Renee's kids doing the voices, and the, uh, she, every once in a while she'll send us, like, the outtakes and stuff, and they sound like they're having a really good time. You know, in the end, that means a lot. I don't know. There are people that we've asked to do stuff, and, and they don't want to do it, and that's a headache. But when we have people, every once in a while we'll have like a producer clamoring to do another episode. And he's like, hey, you know, I know you haven't even run the episode that I just finished, but send me another one. And 
dude, that makes me want to work harder. It makes me want to get these episodes out faster to hear that people are excited about it. And I don't know, that's, uh, it's still January. It's a new year. Anything to get you excited about doing more or taking one extra step, going an extra mile or do you think people in the UK say the extra kilometer or do they say the extra mile <laughs> and they always will? The phrase going the extra mile comes from a long time before kilometers were invented. No, no, I hear you. But do you think at some point that's going to change? I don't think so. It's one of those things that the, once it's said, it's said. Like someday people, little kids will be playing cowboys and Native Americans. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. That'll change, but there's phrases that we use now that you have no idea what they came from, why they're uh, the way they are, and then you'll find it in the dictionary or something, and it'll give you the entomology, or is it etymology? Etymology, I think entomology is study of insects. insects. But I think I say entomology. So <laughs> they give you the etymology of it, and you'll be like, oh, really? That's where that comes from? That's weird. I would have never guessed. I'm sure going the extra mile will be one of those, even though once people don't even remember that there ever was such a unit of measurement. They live in a utopia where everyone uses kilometers. <laughs> you know, it really would be a utopia if everyone <laughs> used kilometers. And that's some strange thing here in America. We have so fought against that. But it's so much easier. Yeah. I fought against it for no good reason either. Yeah. If it's the same kind of thing like with the dollar coins. People just fight against the dollar coin thing for no good reason. And the sad thing is... It costs us so much to keep making paper. It costs money. way more to make uh, paper dollars. And sure, people like them, but you know what? If you just cut off the supply, they'll get used to it. And they'll move on and they'll forget that there ever was a unit of measurement called a mile. And they'll just get over it. You just got to grab that Band-Aid and pull it off in one pull. Don't just peel it back really, really slow and really slow. And then when they go, ah, that pulled a hair, then, okay, I'll put it back on. Sorry. We'll just leave that bandage there forever. But it's this sort of talk that leads (laughs) to those utopian, dystopian societies where it's just like, you know, smoking is bad for you. If you just cut off the demand and said no more smoking ever for anyone People would get used to it. People would kick the habit. People would be healthier. And you have their best interest at heart. But you are taking away the freedom to smoke. And, and, you know, maybe that's a bad example. (laughs) I don't know. It's a kind of an apples to oranges comparison. Comparing smoking to dollar coins. Okay, (laughs) which is worse? Which hurts more people? (laughs) Well, it depends on how hard you throw the dollar coin. (laughs) Which hurts more people? Nobody has dollar coins. <laughs> That's true. That nobody uses them. I don't know. I, I guess I was trying to tie it back to the topic <laughs> at hand. It's very late. We've got to end tonight. We can't go into the wee hour. Well, it's already the wee hours. Already. We can't go into the wee-er hours. So we're just going to end we right now. We can't go into the wee-wee hours of the night. Ooh. Before we go, though, we still have the uh, Broken Mirror story event going on. And now we're going to keep it to the 12th, right? Yes. January 12th, 12th is, is the, cutoff. the cutoff date. I'm not sure exactly when this episode will come out. It may well very well be the 12th. And if so, time's up. If not, hurry up and finish your story and get it in. Uh, January 12th is when we want to have all the stories emailed in. Send it in the body of an email, not as an attachment, please. It's at submissions at doonstief.com is where you're sending it. And big... It is your turn to give the premise. Okay. Someone arrives in town. Oh, see what you did there? It's not as easy as you thought. No, the premise for this year's story was a phone rings in the middle of the night. The voice on the other end of the line says one word, but it is enough. That's it. That's it. You take that premise and you make a story out of it. If you haven't even started yet and it's really, really close to the time, you could do like a flash story about that. If you can come up with a good idea and write a quickie thousand word story or something like that. There will be readers that read all the stories and vote. And basically whatever Big and I want to put on the air, we'll put like the top three or we'll put the top four or we'll, we'll do something 
It just depends on how mean you are to us in the forums that week. <laughs> and That's right. So uh, give it a shot. I'm excited because I'm three quarters of the way through my story right now as we record this. I've been writing on it. And was it last week when we were recording that you were talking about your story? And I said, hey, you know, the funny thing is, as you're talking about your idea, it kind of gave me an idea for my story. And I had like the germ of the idea. And then a few days later, as I was thinking about it while I was taking a shower, the rest of the idea came together and that's it. And then, yeah, I started writing on that and I'm getting uh, fairly close. I worked on it this afternoon. It's been fun writing this story, which often I find when I actually finally get around and write a story, it is fun to write. Although I can never understand why I drag my feet because I enjoy writing the stories. So why is it I try to avoid writing? It's something that I can never figure out. I wish I could because then maybe I could get over it and stop dragging my feet and not writing. But I'm having a good time writing the story. I think it'll be fun. I hope it uh, turns out to be one that people like. I usually, every year in this competition, I place like just out of contention just barely like i'm just under we we're gonna take three stories and i'll be like number four or number five we take six stories and i'm number seven (laughs) whatever it is that we're not gonna take is always where i hit (laughs) which is such a bummer this time around dead last yeah that's what i'm shooting for i don't want it to be close because that's just annoying so i'm putting in extra typos No punctuation. I don't care. (laughs) One last thing about the broken mirror. This is, I think, probably the last episode we'll do before that deadline. So we'll get it out of the way. In the 12th is the deadline. But I would rather get a story on the 13th that you have proofread than a story on the 11th that still has the typos and still has the errors. And just do one more draft if you have to. Just make it the best that you can. Yeah, my recommendation as far as that is, take that story, print it out, hold a pen in your hand, read it out loud. And for every error you find, jab that pen into Oh, no. (laughs) No, make a mark on the paper and then go through. You can correct all sorts of little errors when you read it out loud. And we're going to read them out loud in the end anyways. So if it doesn't sound good read out loud, it's not going to sound good. So that's... uh, Definitely uh, the last proofreading that you should you should give it. So good luck with that, and we look forward to reading your stories. And we look forward to uh, more rambling hours of podcasting in this new year. Don't, well, I do. That's right. Yeah, we already did several rambling hours. Get ready for February, folks. Oh, that's right. We'll, we'll it's announce coming. that soon. Oh, fun stuff. February will come right after January. Get ready for it. Is that part of that Rebecca Black song? (laughs) I wouldn't be surprised. (laughs) Gotta come down, gotta get my cereal, gotta eat my breakfast. Gotta decide which seat to sit in. Oh my gosh, what an awesome song. (sighs) (laughs) On that note, this has been Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. Why not, folks? That's right. Why not? That brings us to the end of the show. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. Thanks for spending time with us. Take two. Rain by Abigail Mannheim. Is it Abigail or just Abby Mannheim? I'm sure you could probably call her either. Oh, uh, no, I don't know. I, that's, that's kind of forward, wouldn't you say? Maybe. Ms. Mannheim, if you're nasty. She uses Abby Mannheim after the word by when she sent the story to us. But then in her uh, introduction, she uses... Her full Abigail name, so I'm thinking you can use either one. Tobias Mannheim. There we go. Tobias Mannheim has been writing... Oh, sorry. 
Darn. Uh, there it is. <laughs> Welcome, there it Renee. Is. Welcome to your lines of mutant, or mant for short. Half man, half ant, mant. All right. Rish Outfield will be playing the part of mant today. Half man? What? What is this guy? He's a teenager that has three lines. But, but it's my only it's line. It's my only line. Uh, she says... Is that from something, that that's my only it's line? It's Monty Python. It's always Monty Python. I mean, uh, they are basically Mute. your mant. Now, uh, can I help you? We want a mattress. Oh, oh what are you saying? What are you saying? Oh. But it's my only line! Oh, it's it's my only line. Line. He's kind of an outcast and is a teenager around 16 or 17 he and the narrator have been friends since they were young children. Have fun tonight. Wang Chung tonight. That's right. Everybody Wang Chung tonight. Okay, sir. You're a teenager. That's an outcast. See if you can channel that. I don't know if you... Uh... Across the nation, so spread the word. Everybody have fun tonight. I know it's going to rain. Oh. Less of a... Let I me. know it's going to rain. Fabulous. Okay, wait, wait. Uh, I, this is right before Mutant kisses her, so I'm going to go. I know it's going to rain. Whoa. You just gave me the look there when be. you said that. That kind of freaks me out. Well, it's either you or the iguana in the tank. Come on. <laughs> a bird. Big Bird, in fact. Hey, I mean, uh, how does Big Bird talk? The Garden Susan. Holy I don't know. Moly. I can't do Big Bird, sorry. Grow the monster. People are probably wondering why uh, I'm talking this whole time doing the Kermit thing, but. I always wonder. <laughs> All there right, are, Renee, there's your there three are lines. So many it took us five minutes to give you three lines. About rainbows. What's on the other side? I want to hear you do it. We stepped outside into the gray, heavy air. Uh, I'm going to do that again. We stepped outside into the gray, heavy air. We took community bicycles to the commissary, where we found we were in luck. Because of the strange weather, they were... Come on, people, stop driving. Am I going to include one of my own outtakes this time? I never have the good funny ones. I should let the cat in, then I might get some more. Okay, I think that car's gone. The law catches up with you. The law catches up with you. The law shall always catch up with you. <laughs> no matter what you say, I will not make it rain. I don't like making things rain. Nature has to do all this stuff. But. I think people are wiser. I think people are wiser. But I have a but. <laughs> okay, now this last one. He's almost dead. Dead? Yeah, this is the last thing he's going to say in his life. Why? Because he dies. Why did he die? Because he, I don't know exactly, I think he just made it rain. It was all very hard on him, this whole experience, and so... Making rain? Yeah, it just like took all his energy out of him. Okay. There will never be anyone like Great Grandmother again. Except Barney. <laughs> Can I burst out of my bubble? What? I want to burst out of my bubble! Careful. Good job. Hey, hard, light. It's stuffy in there and dark and hot. Can, can I do any other audio? Uh, no, not for right now. Maybe later. I need to get your sister now. Audio's fun. It is fun. It's kind of hard. Especially when you can do funny stuff. Yeah, well, this one wasn't that funny, but you did great. <laughs> well, I did some funny did stuff. Some stuff. We'll have to put those in the outtakes. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha
<laughs> like we did for I am the Fart King. <laughs> That's right. That was your debut. Your Dune Steve debut when you were the Ash King. What? Oh, you Ash. Were the Ash King. I am the Ash King. Did I say that? <laughs> no, you said you were the Fart King. <laughs> <laughs> I am the Fart King. Okay, now we're recording. Oh. Hi, world! Find your first line. That'd be a good thing to do. The whole universe was in a hot, dense state that nearly 14 million years ago expansion started. We began to cool the autotrophs, began to drill Neanderthals, develop tools, we built the wall, we built the pyramids, math, science, history, unraveling the mystery that all started with a big bang bang! <laughs> Okay. Now this one, you have to giggle. <laughs> Sorry, that wasn't my giggle. I'm just laughing. Okay, now I need you to say oh. your name that you're gonna use. So, what are you gonna be, the tie-dye flipster? Yeah. Ah. Say, the tie-dye flipster. The tie-dye flipster! Okay, good. And anything else you wanna say before I stop recording? La 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 la! That's fun. Heather Rulo. Uh huh. Um, Rulo. Well, well, what happens if one of us farts? There's a story. <laughs> Young Rain's sister was played by the tie dye flipster. Okay. <laughs> oh my god. All right, now it's Jenkins Carlos' turn. Jenkins. That's not how you do it. Okay. Can I tell you how, how to pronounce it in there? You really need to breathe in on the S and really push out on the K. I can put that part in the bloopers, but I'm not putting that in the actual cast. Ooh, good. Say the whole thing, and Rain was played by Jean Cascalo without uh, in the microphone. And Rain was played by Jean Cascalo. Okay. Everybody Wang Chung. <sighs> Thank you, you're a lovely audience. Yeah, I believe uh, I added a scene where he was molested. Oh, good. By Carlos? By Richard Simmons. He hugs Richard Simmons while he's all greased up <laughs> because he's such a fan of his work. Great things that he does. So let's share a lamentary dis... Let's share a lam lament lament lam lament Lam lamentatory. I think is the word. Maybe one thing the story explores is if you had something like a utopia. That's interesting. Like an utopia. You don't say an utopia. You say a utopia, because because you it, use... it pronounces as, as though it started with a Y. You're right. It's interesting. I saw somebody the other day who was doing that, where they were saying a. And it was some abbreviation, like XLR. They were saying A XLR, but you don't say it that way. It's an XLR because it's pronounced as though it had an E X. It was irritating me every time they did it wrong. Anyways, sorry. Well, don't worry, Daryl. It's all completely harmless. <coughs> he finished his third cup of coffee and was positively. <coughs> oh, sorry. And uh, it was by Ferret Steinmetz. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. It was uh, Ferret Steinmetz stopped me cold. We'll let Ferret Steinmetz have his day of glory. I mean, because how often can... Every dog has its day, but does every ferret has its day? <laughs> you know, there are some states, I think, that it's illegal to have a ferret as yeah. a pet. Um, I, California may actually have been one of them because one of my buddies moved to LA and he had ferrets and uh, he had to like secret them and not let his landlord know that he had them or neighbors or anything. And it may be just that they're really dirty, but I don't know. Why would they? It, because know. they have a scent? Is that why the, mm, they're I'm, not I don't legal? think so. I think it's got more to do with... They perch on the chests of sleeping children and suck their lives out. No, yeah, that no, kind of that's stuff. cats. I think it's because they're like rats with wings. I mean, wait, they don't have wings. That's no, that's else. also cats. Huh. Um. <laughs> I found it pretty good. If they'd sent it to the Dune Steve, we probably would have taken it. And we'd have said, Ferret Steinmetz, I don't care if you're illegal in California, you're coming to the Dune Steve. So 
You'll enjoy it, I think. Stay. Bark, bark, wagtail. Good boy. Good boy.